tape? What the? <laughs> <laughs> it's two thirty. Press it? play. All right. Oh, that's cool. So when it's our turn to talk, I guess we should just kind of push a mic. Over. I don't know if they have an Omni mic or. That looks fun. All right. Is this one? Yeah. I don't know if that one's right. Now. This one's on. Testing one, two, three. Probably out of our control. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the session. Uh, I'll lead off uh, since my computer's hooked up. My name's Tom Hudson. I used to work for Analog Computing Magazine back in the early 80s. Did some video game work back then and uh, always wanted to work on certain pieces of hardware that were inaccessible at the time or they, there was no documentation, there was no internet to tell you how to do this stuff. So it was uh, kind of a, just a dream. And, and uh, just earlier this year I found out uh, about a gentleman who's on the panel with us who gave me some information that let me get taken off on some of this cool stuff on retro hardware. Uh, basically, my idea was I've got uh, at home, I've got a, uh, an Atari Tempest arcade game and I've got an Atari Space Duel. Uh, there's a color XY, of vector monitors, my favorite systems of all time. They're just a lot of fun. Tempest is my all time favorite game. So uh, I started thinking about it and I thought, you know, it'd be really cool to do the old Cinematronics Space Wars game on the Space Duel hardware. Since the, it's a two-player, set for two-player uh, games, has all the right controls. The controls are perfect. It's got all the buttons you need. Uh, and I thought, you know, it'd be also kind of neat to do it since I don't usually have a second person around to play. It'd be great to have the second player be computer controlled. And, uh, of course, the big bonus is uh, over the Cinematronics original hardware, which is black and white, is the Tempest and, and Space Duel hardware is actually in color. So that was great. Then I thought about it a little more, and I talked to uh, Clay Calgill down the panel here, and we realized that you could actually use a Tempest, con uh, Tempest uh, arcade box to drive one of these games because you could use the spinner control to rotate your ship and use a couple of the buttons for fire and, and hyperspace or, or thrust and then... Uh, the hyperspace button using the player to start. So it's kind of a kind of a hacky kind of thing to do, but that's uh, sometimes that's what you got to do. And it was, and hey, I had the hardware sitting there, so let's do it. So there's the old Cinematronics uh, Space Wars, uh, neat old game. It's a lot of fun. And uh, back in uh, what back in the 80s, uh, uh, early 80s, we were uh, thought it was a, a really neat, fun one. Uh, didn't see too many of them though, and it was always a favorite of mine because it had gravity. It simulated gravity around the star, so that was kind of fun. So uh, we got in there and I uh, started coding. Clay got me some source code uh, to work with uh, from one of his uh, games, Vector Breakout, and it let me see exactly how to get into the hardware and start working with it. Uh, pretty fun thing to do. This is actually uh, a screen capture from uh, MAME, the multi-arcade machine emulator. That's what I do my development work on. Uh, let me do the basic test to get the, the thing up and running and at, at least get it a pretty good guarantee that we'd have something on the screen when we put it on the real hardware. And we'll get into that a little later. And there's a couple of the other screens. We have a, there's an option selector since the uh, Tempest and Space Duel boxes don't have the 10 key keypad like the original uh, Space Wars we set up a little menu system where you can use the spinner to set your parameters, kind of like you do in, uh, in uh, Space Duel. And it's got high score stuff. It writes to the proms and the machine and saves all that stuff out. Uh, of course, we threw our initials in there as a fun uh, little placeholder. And there's some of the actual gameplay. And then you can see you'd have the, on the, if you're running this on the Space Duel hardware, there's a red set of controls and a green set of controls. So we'd have the red and green ships. Uh, with red and green scoring associated with them. And then uh, basically uh, started looking at doing some other stuff. And back in, uh, when we worked at analog computing, we worked on the Atari 8-bit computers, which coincidentally were 6502 processors. Uh, so I started thinking, gee, these, uh, uh, the Tempest machines and Space Duel machines are also 6502 processors. This would be a fun thing to port over uh, and uh, Bacterion, basically, if you aren't familiar with it, was a knockoff of the arcade game Ripoff. It was a ripoff of Ripoff, uh, where you're, uh, and it was a vector game itself. So it was a perfect natural uh, transition for that game. Again, the controls on Space Duel are going to be perfect because uh, Bacterion was set up originally as a one or two player game. You could play competitively or co uh, cooperatively, which was fun. Uh, and I thought, well, might as well do the same thing with the second player being computer controlled 
if you don't have a second person around. And on the Tempest uh, box, uh, we have it set up for one player only, and I'm going to set up a second player that would be computer controlled if, if you want to play that way. And there's some screenshots from it. Uh, I've actually got it on this machine. We might run a little later as a, if you're interested uh, under MAME. And again, it uses the same, a lot of the same code as the other one. It's kind of nice to be able to reuse that stuff. And once you have it in there, it's, you can crank out these other games pretty easily. Uh, a lot of fun. It's just going to be, a, 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 I think, a good playing game when we're finished. Uh, if you look at the, uh, I don't have the, the game selector. There's a, there we are, game selector. On this one, there are three different cell structures for what's in the center of the screen that the uh, little bacterion creatures are stealing. And then uh, there's a game version, which would either be classic, which is a straight up port of the original game, or a 2012 version, which will have all sorts of uh, improvements to it or enhancements. And there's a, a still from an actual game where the things are stealing your cells away from you. So, and then the third game I'm working on, it's interesting, it's not quite, it's sort of retro hardware, it's actually working on the old Atari 8-bit machines, but it's kind of a hybrid. I uh, went back and revisited some old code from Analog Computing Magazine, a game called Planetary Defense. Went in and I thought, you know, it'd be fun. We never got to put in some additional features back then because there was only 16K of memory uh, that we were programming for. And once you ran out of memory uh, in, for the magazine, we couldn't go beyond that. So there were features I wanted to put in, some ad additional bonus stuff. Uh, and so I've, I've added those in. And then we went really kind of fun. There's uh, an emulator out for the Android uh, operating system for handheld devices. We uh, added some features for that, which is, uh, includes a touch screen play. So you can tap on the screen instead of having to use a, since there's no joystick on these things on, the, on, your, tel on your iPhone, or the Android phones rather. You can actually touch, tap on the screen to play it, which is a real natural interface. And then we put in a leaderboard th through the internet, which it gets through to over uh, a uh, new device which is emulated inside the uh, Atari 800 emulator. This wasn't so much of a challenge because the Atari 8-bit machines are really well known and we worked with them for years. But uh, we're looking at, uh, if I can get somebody to get me the information, we'll have it set up so on the actual hardware we'll be able to submit the high scores to our internet leaderboard uh, over the SIO to PC interface. And this shows a couple of the screens from Planetary Defense 2012. This is off the, uh, captured off an Atari 8-bit emulator, and it shows the, the internet leaderboard entry screen, which shows up when you're on the emulator, and submit your score to the, uh, to the web. Uh, my development tools uh, are pretty simple. Uh, there's a, an assembler called ATASM. And anybody who's familiar with the old 8-bit uh, world back in the 80s, there was a fantastic macro assembler called Mac 65 from OSS. That was my favorite assembler back in the day, and these guys uh, with ATASM have emulated that, uh, that uh, assembler, and it works just like it. Its syntax is the same, and it's actually got some cool Atari uh, features in it for generating Atari code. I use Atari 8-bit emulators a lot to just do my play testing. They work great. Uh, I use uh, Colleen on the Android and uh, Atari 800 Win on, on the Windows system. Colleen, C-O-L-L-E-E-N. If you go to the Android market, you'll find it. Uh, he couldn't call it Atari anything because he would have gotten sued or kicked off the market. So he, it, Colleen was the code name for the Atari 800 back in the day. So a lot, uh, that is a nice little emulator. Pardon me. It has Planetary Defense 2012 built in as a little convenience feature. You just go to the preferences, tap it, and you're playing. Uh, I use on, to emulate the vector hardware, Tempest and uh, Space Duel, I use the uh, MAME, multi-arcade machine emulator. It's pretty good. Uh, it, it, in general, will do the basic emulation I need to, to prove that my code's going to work and that the drawing is going to do what I want it to do on the screen. Uh, certainly beats having to burn a set of ROMs every time I want to play test. Uh, finally, I, I, since I was involved with Autodesk 3D Studio Max, uh, I, I do a lot of things uh, through that, just kind of as a, because it's just natural for me. To generate the shapes, like the little spaceships and stuff like that uh, in these games, I've actually uh, written a plugin for Max that lets you draw them in into the 3D Studio. Uh, you can actually animate them and do things, and then this thing will spit out either the animated versions or just the fixed versions in any scale you want, and it spits it out as assembly source code that you can include in your source file, and they go right into the Tempest machine or whatever, and, and it's vector 
generator can draw them. It's a total time saver, and I'm really lazy, so I, I, I really enjoy using it. As far as hardware challenges, uh, you really need to have accurate documentation, and a lot of this stuff was never released by Atari, but luckily, thanks to the internet, it's, a lot of it's out there now. You, you need accurate memory maps and system uh, uh, register information to let you know where you, how you actually uh, uh, drive these machines. And I've got a link there um, to a, a pretty good document that has the uh, Tempest memory map, and there's some similar ones out there for Space Duel. And they're fairly similar. It's funny how Atari, I figured they would have used the same, pretty much the same boards in these machines, but they didn't. There was, there's quite a bit of, of uh, there are quite a bit of differences in between Tempest and, and Space Duel, for example, which, you know, it's just funny they did custom stuff and I thought they would have saved money by using the same hardware. Uh, the other thing you need is accurate information on the vector state machine. That's what actually drives the vectors on the screen. Uh, there's some pretty good information out there that this document I got ref uh, referenced here had one little factual error in it that uh, when uh, Clay went to run the, the uh, game on the hardware for the first time gave us some wacky uh, results on the screen, and all it was was one bit wrong on, uh, on one of the op, op codes for the vector state machine. And uh, once we corrected that, boom, it was up and running and worked fine. The other thing on the vector machines you have to watch out for is something called the spot killer. Uh, to protect the, the display from damage, they did all sorts of things like making sure if, if, if it detected it wasn't drawing vectors at a certain point on the screen, drawing the, the electron beam down a certain area, it would reset itself or turn the screen off to protect the CRT from damage. You have to make sure that you are always drawing something on, on both halves of the screen, even if it's not visible. I mean, I draw invisible lines around the border to, to fool it, and it, that's all it takes. Uh, there's a thing called the watchdog, which you have to write to periodically so it doesn't think it's crashed. If it thinks it cr it's crashed, it'll reset itself. So that's another thing. Just got to write to the watchdog every, every so often, and you're good. The other thing that was not real obvious, and Clay gave me the information on this one, was something called vector drift. It just has to do with the way the hardware works in these vector machines. If it draws too many vectors around the screen, you know, and, and if you just draw too much, they start drifting off, and you're, uh, you might think your spaceship's drawing here, but it's actually drawing here. Easy enough to fix that whenever you're drawing a new object, you center the beam and then draw from there. And in fact, my little handy utility where I create my shapes for uh, in uh, 3D Studio accounts for all that and it gives you all the, the centering information that it, uh, already added in for you. So, uh, gee, software challenges. This is, this is probably the most fun part to me. Uh, when I, for example, took Bacterion from the Atari 800 world over to the Vector world, uh, Atari screen coordinates were like 160 by 96 and it was uh, landscape and Tempest is portrait orientation display. Uh, the vector screen coordinates are quite a bit uh, larger. There's like plus or minus 500 on each axis is what, we're, what I use internally. So all the screen coordinates had to be translated from bytes to words, uh, which wasn't that big a deal, but it was kind of a little challenge. I had to get into the code and deal with that. So that's probably the big one on doing a port of an old game. Uh, you only have about 20K of program ROM area to work with on these things. And, you know, it, I've been working in a, a, a world of PCs and gigabytes of memory and, and C++, and you don't even think about how much memory you got. And you're writing programs, and you're just doing whatever you want. Well, I started writing this, getting back on the 6502 code, and it was a real, real wake-up call one day when I was, I was using all these macros, and, oh, this is so cool and fun. And then all of a sudden, I noticed I was uh, over, uh, over my 20K boundary real quick. So that's... Uh, it's really old school programming. You have to go back to the old ways of doing things. You might want to do things with a big table, uh, a data table to save yourself processor time, but those take you up a lot of memory. And then if you're not using uh, a table to do it, you have to do it with the CPU. And the 6502 is not the fastest processor ever made either. So you have to find a balance in there. And it, it really is a fun challenge. I, it, I like to tell people I don't like I don't generally play a lot of video games. I, my video games are sitting down with the program and figuring out how to puzzle to make it work. So it's a real challenge to do, and it is like stepping back in time for me. It's, it's I haven't touched 6502 code in about 25 years, and I got back into it, and it was like riding a bike. You're back in there pretty quick, and the the, the challenges are there, and it's just a, a ton of fun. So. Uh, 
I do want to give credit where it's due. Clay Cowgill was a, a fantastic mentor during this whole process, got me some code to work with on the vector stuff, and uh, it really streamlined my work. And I wish I had found out about his stuff 10 years ago because I would have been on this that much faster. But anyway, that's my stuff. Uh, I'll hand it off to, I guess, the next person down the road. We'll have questions. We'll have a question and answer thing later for everybody at yeah, once, I guess. Right. Yeah, maybe we'll switch places. Go for a video. <laughs> 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 That's rather <laughs> ominous sound. <laughs> <laughs> um, so first of all, thank you everyone for coming and choosing us over Tetris or whatever is going on <laughs> next door. Um, I've always kind of been a hardware development guy. Well, first of all, a uh, bit of background. I'm one of the owners at Ground Control. So those of you who have been downtown and played our games, thank you for coming there as well. Um, <clears throat> I've always come at this from sort of a hardware side of things and just being interested in old arcade games and home gaming systems and whatnot. And uh, growing up with those, you know, they're always kind of these fabulous mystical boxes that were way too expensive to ever own. And you know, by the 90s and 2000s, you could go get pretty much anything you wanted for a couple hundred bucks, give or take. And like Tom said, after you play with things for a while, the interest level starts to switch over. What can you do with it after you're, you're done playing the game? So um, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about briefly is just sort of how do you do this stuff on real hardware? You know, if it's not MAME, if it's not uh, some emulator of some sort, what do you want to do if you actually have a game run on something out there that people can plug in and play the original way it came out? So my fancy uh, slideshow program here is from Google. <coughs> so the first thing is a lot of this stuff isn't going to be on the internet. Um, and a lot of it that is out there you have to be careful of. Like Tom said, one little wrong bit in one document and you're stuck for ages and hours. So what I've kind of adopted is uh, don't throw anything away. No matter how inconsequential it might seem, uh, can come in and save you one day when it comes to things you might need to find out. Uh, first thing is, is uh, paper and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, this was a few years ago, you know, the, the tonnage has not probably gone up by then. Um, a lot of stuff that's on the internet now is sort of need to know basis, you know, you, you get a copy of a data sheet or uh, something. It oftentimes isn't everything that was in the original book. Um, the original books a lot of times would have articles on, you know, this is how you use something or this is what we used it in. Um, old magazines and reviews and press releases a lot of times can give you insight into things that you might need to figure out. And a lot of the stuff that I like to do in particular was uh, do something on hardware that somebody else hadn't documented yet. Um, so a lot of the early MAME stuff, if you guys have played with those, the Sega uh, G80 games like Star Trek and uh, oh, Space Fury, those kind of games. Uh, we were hacking on that stuff before MAME was around, so that's how a lot of the MAME stuff came to be, was guys like myself and J-Rock and Mark Spath and these guys sort of figuring out how stuff works at a low level, documenting it well enough so that the emulator guys could come in and actually get it working, and then we have a nice you know, handy development system to run under Windows or whatever, Linux later on. Um, yeah, the garage kind of has the same thing going on. <laughs> and again, it's, you know, if you get rid of something, you're going to need it later. So, you know, buy storage space. Useful thing. So, again, paper. Um, not everything is digitized. Not everything's up on Google. Uh, great places to look are Powell's Bookstore, um, technical books in particular, yard sales, you know, anytime anybody's giving away old data books, you know, these things. Back in the day, every engineering corporation had a huge amount of library, basically, that were just books that were given to them by every chip manufacturer and distributor, and this would just have all the documentation for all these components. And if you tear into something nowadays that maybe doesn't have a memory map on it or maybe doesn't have a service manual or something, you can learn an awful lot just by looking up the chips. And a lot of the times, you know, these systems would be designed based on something else. So 
one chip might lead you to a data book that has a diagram that suggests how they would hook it up to something else. And that might give you a little bit of information on how you need to talk to this thing or what else you should be looking for in a system. Um, old magazines are great. A lot of those would have, kind of like today, you get these, you know, Maker Faire type stuff where people would do something. Before internet was around, the way to distribute that information was in the hobbyist magazines and the newsletters and the users groups. So sometimes those old things would have an article. I remember one, I think it was Radio Electronics, was uh, how to make an Atari 2600 cartridge copier. And that would have been probably around 1986 or something. It loaded from tape into RAM. Well, that's basically the same basis of every embedded development system today. You know, it's, it's a way to load code onto something that probably wasn't really designed to have code loaded onto it and still be able to debug and, and make it do what you want. Um, textbooks, again, especially old ones. Um, great thing about Amazon is you can type in any old ISBN number or parts of words and pop-up books and, you know, for 90% of, 99% of the population, it's just old stuff. Um, so 99 cents, you know, $1.25. You pay more for shipping to get it to you than the actual item itself. But then you've got this wealth of old information. Uh, if any of you are into chiptune music and, and old digital synthesis stuff, a lot of those early books are, you know, how to make a sound device, be it a, a synthesizer or a sound chip or a game from the ground up, you know, here, here's a timer, here's a counter, here's a filter. Um, and you can learn an awful lot by going back farther in time than maybe picking up a contemporary thing where it's just, oh, you call this library and it gives you a 64 voice synthesizer with, you know, billion megahertz of whatever. Um, <coughs> Service manuals are good to look for. A lot of the times they will explain the operations of things that you might have to understand how to control in the hardware. Um, if you're off the beaten path, if you're not doing uh, something, you know, Atari 5200 or NES or SNES or ColecoVision or something, when you get into those strange processors that aren't well understood or maybe aren't well documented and just haven't got the love online, uh, you have to do some digging yourself. College library, school, you know, resources, any of those can, can bring up information. And even if it's sort of non-traditional, uh, press releases, photographs, any place where you can dig up a name, uh, a little bit of information, you know, John Smith worked at Atari in 1987, you start digging, sometimes you can go back and find the original people. And even just posting things on a blog or a website or, or a forum, um, I've had people from Bally Midway back in the day you know, I had a, gee, I wonder why they did this on a schematic thing, and three years later, get an email from the designer that said, oh, well, it's because of this, this, and this, you know, so uh, people that, that were working on this back then did enjoy what they were doing, I think, to a large degree, and they, they're still kind of interested, so you get some really interesting emails from time to time. Um, for electronics, when it comes to running something on the real hardware, you know, it's not just as simple as like, drag and drop a file in this window and double click. Um, you're probably going to need to dig up some old electronics and, and hardware that's out there. Again, the good news is eBay is your friend. For virtually everyone, this stuff is old junk, you know, get it out of here kind of pricing. Um, so you can get a lot of cool stuff for cheap. And <clears throat> the older the better in some cases. So a lot of the times if you know what kind of processor was in something, uh, you might need to understand how it works with some other chips. Maybe there's some stuff on there that's custom and just isn't documented. Uh, old logic analyzers are great because you can literally hook them up to the processor and a lot of them would disassemble the actual code, the stuff that's running from the, from the EEPROMs or whatever on the board. And you could see it in real time and look at things and record it out and dump it out of serial ports and sort of make your own development environment based around a couple few pieces you might pick up off of eBay or a, or a yard sale kind of thing. The Bay Area is great for this kind of stuff because there were tons of people doing it back in the day. Um, East Coast, Boston, you know, Mass, that kind of stuff as well. Portland even, uh, Portland was a hotbed for Tektronix and, and Hewlett Packard. So, <clears throat> excuse me, so a lot of things there. If you, you know, Craigslist ad here and there, somebody will come in and have a box of stuff they're willing to get rid of or, or help you out on. So um, this slide's pretty much just gives you a couple things to think about. Um, Romulators is a term, basically before emulators, they were a way of loading memory onto a device, whether or not it was an arcade game or a VCR, or whatever you use a processor, so that you could basically put your own code there and try to run it. Um, those are great to find because it lets you drop your own stuff in on something that wouldn't normally be running anyone else's code. Um, the Fluke 9000, which uh, is a favorite of the arcade repair guys, um, in particular the 9010 is cool because 
what it does is it has a, a plug-in pod, basically, where you can take a processor, plug this thing into it, and then do things like learn the memory map. Um, it literally has a learn button on it. It will go out and do little tests and probes and come back and tell you what is RAM memory, where there is ROM memory, where it thinks there might be registers. And then it also works as sort of a poor man's development system where you can manually type in some opcodes and tell it to go run code at a certain address and try little experiments. Uh, so a lot of the early MAME stuff with uh, the Sega G80 hardware was me doing that with the vector generator. We had no idea what it worked or how it worked or what it did. Um, so you go in and start messing with things until you see something go wrong on the screen and then you drill down a little closer and change a couple bits here and see what, what modifies where and pretty soon you can reverse engineer uh, what it is you need to know to make it do something in a controlled manner. Um, for real hardware, a uh, couple things I've learned over the years. Uh, testing on what you actually want it to work with is really important. And this even goes down to Vectrex and Super Nintendo and PlayStation and everything else. Um, you, do, you probably don't have the factory's original development system. You probably don't know all the variations of how they change things over the years. And just for safety purposes, especially on older arcade games, you really need to make sure that what you have or make available to someone isn't going to kill their machine. Um, that's a, a danger on old arcade games in particular because you can do things that would burn out a monitor um, if it goes haywire. If you don't do something right or if it's a difference between Rev A and Rev B, things cannot work properly. So uh, find it helpful to pick up as many examples of whatever you're working on as possible. Even if it's just you know every variation of a 2600 or every variation of Intellivisions or Sega, you know, whatever. Um, Dead or Alive is generally useful. If nothing else, you can open them up and see what parts are on the boards and understand that if, gee, you know, you think you have something right and you make a run of cartridges that you're going to sell with Atari Age or one of these guys and you start getting complaints that, oh, it doesn't work on my machine, that's not a good thing. You, you want to find that out early on and typically what will happen is you'll find out that, yeah, there's some little variation and it's between this serial number and that serial number and once you know about it, you fix your code and things work, but uh, finding that before it goes to production is, is a good idea. Um, another thing that's really useful are old evaluation boards, things that may have been used by a chip manufacturer to try to get these, ma these uh, game designers back in the day to actually use their device. Uh, so easy example, you know, National Semiconductor would make a board that would just have a processor on it and some documentation for how to interface to it. A lot of the times that's easier to experiment with than tearing into some giant old piece of arcade game or home system that may intentionally have some things in there to make it hard on you to copy it or to run code there. So um, that's an easy one. The other thing to look for is uh, relatives of something. Um, and that's kind of ties back into magazine articles and everything else where you may actually have uh, a little lead that, yeah, this particular computer was based off of an earlier one. The earlier one might have better documentation or may have been before things got popular and people started trying to hide stuff from you, you know, so that you, you can't run your own code on it. Um, the, I'll give you a little tour here. So this rat's nest is on the bottom shelf, uh, the thing with the keys is a Fluke 9010. Uh, so that's a, it was called a microsystems troubleshooter. It was mainly used for, for testing and diagnostics, but in this case, I was using it to hack in and control the game, uh, the main circuit board out of a Qbert um, arcade machine. Uh, Qbert was a, an 8088, so it was a close relative of a PC XT, the, the early IBM PCs. Um, that in turn enabled me to use the old Turbo C stuff that came under DOS to write software for it in C. So you can see how these things kind of chain together. It's, yeah, it's completely alien hardware, but the processor is the same. It still has RAM. It still has ROM. Um, you can adapt a lot of old tech out there to run on it. Uh, right below that is a, a Tektronix, a, a 1241 logic analyzer, and all the little probes and flying wires there are, are hooked up to the, the 8088 processor on that board. Um, so that would allow me to basically explore what Qbert was doing at a hardware level and have Logic Analyzer stop and tell me if something's going on. So if I thought there was something suspicious about a particular memory address, <coughs> excuse me, the, the Logic Analyzer could trigger on that and 
in a number of ways. You know, if it ever reads from this address, let me know. Um, that's useful if you need to, for example, a lot of the times uh, make a little bit more room for memory. A lot of the old games would have a big memory map but only use a small portion of it for their code, leaving a whole bunch of unused space. The thing is you never really know if back in the day Atari may have used some of that space for their own debugging stuff and there may still be some code left over in the game that actually goes out there and, and monkeys with it. So sometimes you have to do a little bit of sleuthing and actually say, is there anything going on here? And you play a whole bunch of games and you know, do as many different weird things you can think of as, a, as you can to the hardware and software. And if it's never used, that might be extra space for you to go out and, and put some more code there and get past a memory limitation or something like that. So this is just a different shot of the same thing, uh, kind of upside down and backwards. But uh, again, you know, all this stuff was just sort of gleaned off of eBay and flea markets and, and whatever. And yeah, it's you know going on 30 years old, but it was the same stuff that they would have used uh, to make things work back when it was new. Um, so it is yeah, still relevant if you're, in your, if you're into this kind of thing. And the key is, it's old, it's not made anymore. A lot of times they don't make the parts. So if you find it, buy it, keep it, use it later, have spares. <laughs> you don't want to be halfway through a project and that one critical thing uh, dies and you, you can't do anything. Um, the other thing that I, I brought with me and maybe after the talk, we'll just throw it out on the table here. Got a box of just old weird stuff, uh, Super Nintendo development systems and Sega Genesis dev systems and 68,000 ice machines and other stuff. So um, we'll bring it out and if you guys want to filter by and poke and prod and see stuff that's not generally seen by the public very often, feel free. Um, so with that, I'll yield over to Ed and thanks for coming. Oh, oh, Chris, sorry. <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm Chris. I'm tall. One sec. <laughs> I'm hunched over like a freak. Oh, okay. I'm probably just like... Hi, I'm Chris. Uh, maybe I can do that. I'm Chris. I'm the guy that did uh, that Super Mario clone for uh, 2600. It's actually called uh, Princess Rescue now for obvious reasons. Um, and by the way, if you haven't checked it out, it's at the Atari Age booth uh, over there. And um, these guys here, they have a lot of great information. And... Uh, one thing that probably makes me a little bit more different from them is you guys more do it, do more for really a living. I mean, you, this kind of thing as far as, plus you have a lot more experience in, than I do in this sort of thing. So, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> or no hair. <laughs> well, that's true. Uh, but, uh, so, uh, myself, I'm more of a hobbyist and probably like a lot of you guys out there are probably have some sort of fascination in or it's maybe it's a hobby of yours and um, uh, we're probably more alike in that way where where you're just like an everyday kind of person going hmm I wonder if I could do this and what does it take to do it and that's kind of what I did was um, I, I the Atari always had a special place in my heart it was the first video game system that I had and grew up with and it's a lot of fun and I have a lot of fond memories of it and uh, over the years, I dabbled in programming as a hobby and made my own games, but never really released them. I just uh, just had a lot of fun just uh, doing it and uh, just seeing what I could do. And it was always a hobby for me. Um, and just over the years, um, as more things became available, like uh, emulators especially, and it seemed to be like a rekindled uh, interest back in uh, old school games, and especially with like a... Uh, the games nowadays that you can play online, uh, like a lot of, uh, what do you call them? Uh, casual. Casual, yeah, like a lot of those kind of games, like casual games, seem to spark an interest in, in a short, playing on a short-term basis. And I thought, well, um, wouldn't it be kind of cool to see them on like something on Atari 2600 or maybe take in a game that had been done further down the line, see if it's actually possible to do it on, a, on an Atari system? And um, so I thought I'd give it a go, and I tried my own uh, game. Um, using this uh, thing that's readily available to anybody. It's uh, called Batari Basic. Does anybody have any like uh, basic programming experience at all? Yeah? A couple of you? Um, that, that's, that's always helpful. That will, uh, if you end up wanting to make your own Atari 2600 game, for example, that will definitely help you out understanding like Batari Basic if you go that route. 
uh, as far as uh, making a game. And um, that always helps. And if not, uh, it's actually it's not that hard to learn. I learned basic programming when I was nine years old. So if, you know, if I can learn it when I was nine, you can learn it now. Let's see why not. Um, and uh, so that's if you're interested in Atari 2600, uh, like just just jumping right at it and trying to figure out, oh, okay, let's see what it takes to make a game. That's probably a good way to go if you don't know assembly. If you know assembly, great. Go, go that route because you can do more with that. Because Atari Basic is more like an interpreter. It, you're it, you're kind of limited with what it can do. And that Super Mario game, uh, I did make with Atari Basic. And because of that, there's a reason why certain things do the uh, do what they do. Uh, more, more or less because of the limitations of Atari. Actually, more the limitations of the Atari 2600, because uh, there are a lot of limitations. That's one thing you got to worry about too. Is when you're uh, developing a game for an old system, is the limitations what you can and can't do. Um, and as I found out, uh, there's a lot of that <laughs> with the Atari 2600 and just the way it does things. Uh, the Atari 2600 is constantly drawing to the screen uh, all the time. Um, it's just it writes the video display on the fly. There's no video memory or anything like that to buffer it before it goes out. So you have very little time between screen draws to actually execute code before it has to draw that screen again. So you gotta keep track of a lot of things. You gotta keep track of how many CPU cycles that you're going through uh, before each screen draw. Because if you don't, if you go over that, the screen will start to roll and it'll lose sync with the television and it won't work right. Um, another thing is, uh, Memory, the Atari has very little of that. Uh, 128 bytes to be exact, and which doesn't give you much to play with. And that's another reason why the game plays the way it does. I couldn't store like what's like for example, you hit the yellow block in the game, which re resembles the question mark in the actual game. Um, there's a reason why it's kind of a mystery. It's random. It it doesn't it's a random occurrence what's in that yellow block because I couldn't store what was actually supposed to be in it. <laughs> so I was like, well, it'd be kind of fun to randomize it. Actually, limitations like that will uh, uh, make you be creative too. It's like, well, if I can't do that, what if I just change a little bit and it's like this, which uh, gave me a few ideas for the game to, uh, uh, because of the limitations, uh, to, uh, as I said, it spawned a few new ideas. And like, for example, when you jump on the platform, it actually turns into the moving platform. It actually turns into a, a solid platform because I there wasn't enough space for the code for him to ride the platform. And the thing about the Atari as well is there's only two sprites that you have on the screen at one time, and that's it. There are ways around it, but with Atari, you're kind of limited, and I couldn't do that with a scrolling screen going on at the time. So. Uh, so because it had two sprite limitation, I decided, oh, well, I don't want him writing it because if he's on this platform, then I can't bring in an enemy character to, to help things more, uh, be more difficult. So I said, I'll just turn it to a solid platform that way it frees up that sprite and then there I can jump on. And so there's, there's things like that that you have to kind of think about. It's like, well, if I can't do that, then what else can I do? And then, um, so there's those limitations that make you do that um, as well as, uh, Say ROM space, that's definitely something, <laughs> too. There's a, one good thing uh, about the Atari is y y there's a 32K maximum ROM space, and that's done through what's called bank switching. Uh, most games have 2 to 4K in it, and that's it. That's all there is. And um, because addressable at one time, that's it. That's all you have is uh, 4K maximum. So there's a thing called bank switching where uh, you have uh, like rows of memory that you can um, access, not at one time, but it's there. So you'll it'll access a uh, code from one 4K space. Then when the part of the program says, "Oh, I need to go over here now to this bank to uh, to access this part of the code," it can do that. And um, but the one thing about bank switching is, once it switches banks, it doesn't know what the other banks are doing. You have to everything has to be kind of self-contained. So if you have like a data table somewhere that it's reading, it has to be all on the same bank. Um, there's one really good video out there to, if you're really considering using something like Atari Basic to uh, make Atari games with. And there's a video tutorial by Tinkernet. 
if you go to YouTube and just look up his tutorial, um, he tells you basically how to download and install pretty much the developing package for the uh, Batari Basic uh, system. And then from that point, he actually goes into it, shows you how to use it, shows you how to start programming uh, using the commands. There's also uh, online uh, Random Terrain's website uh, they have the whole entire manual for Batari Basic, and that's a good read to go over if you're going to go that route uh, of programming with that language. Uh, read over the commands. And it also kind of tells you how it, with that website as well, kind of tells you how the uh, Atari uh, uses its uh, the cycle, the CPU cycles and everything uh, to make up a display. And um, so it's a good read if you're going to go that route. So definitely watch the Tinkernut video. Um, if you're going to use that. Um, and that's what I did. Uh, what else should I be talking about? Any, any ideas, guys? How about sound? Sound? Oh, yeah, because the game does have sound. Uh, the Atari uh, has uh, something called the TIA chip, and it takes care of the, uh, the sound, uh, the, the video display. Uh, what else does it do? It has, I think, is, that the, is it the Riot that has the 128 bytes, or is that the TIA? Riot has the Riot ran the, my own timers, is the Riot. The Riot, okay, and it also does the controller inputs TIA too. TIA has television interface adapter. And, a television interface adapter, that's right. And so um, it also does the music, and uh, I like the, like the music, I mean, it's, and everything else that's going on, it's pretty much all going on at the same time, and the Atari has two channels of music that you can uh, write to. So you can have just, basically that means you can have two sounds going on at the same time. And, um, and that's, with the game out there, that's what uh, you can hear. It's just, uh, I was able to just do two, uh, what do you call that, polyphonic sound? Yeah. Two voices. Two voices, yeah, that's it, two voices. And uh, so I kind of had to back off a little bit on a, I couldn't do that full, you know how the Super Mario theme, everybody knows it. And, the way it sounds the way that it does is because of, once again, the limitations. I could only do two channels at one time. And not just that, the Atari was really never meant to do soundtracks or, <laughs> at all. And uh, more, it was really meant more for sound effects. And so I, uh, one package that comes with Batari is a music and sound uh, program and that you can use. And it'll actually have like a layout of the keyboard and a different uh, different uh, sound channels and things like that that you can play around with to figure it out, figure out what kind of what it sounds like, and uh, it'll also create the data uh, the data uh, variables for you, so you can uh, just copy and paste it into your code. And I found the sheet music for the original Super Mario uh, mu uh, game, and I just uh, and I can read music, so. I just took the sheet music and just kind of used that program, just kind of just plugged away on the keys and made it happen, copied the code over. Also another thing about the Atari 2600 is you don't have all the notes available to you either at all. <laughs> um, it's, there are certain notes that aren't there or you have to change the tone and, oh, there it is, you know, there's, there's notes. So that's why the tone changes in the sound sometimes is because that's the only way I could produce that note. And uh, sometimes you know it's not even available to you at all. And that's always fun. Um, so you have to kind of be a little bit creative. There's another thing with the limitation is you got to be creative. Go, okay, how do I get around not having this note? Oh, okay, so I'll just, you know, I'll transpose it a little or do something to make it work. And sure enough, it works. And there's a there's also a um, a Tetris game out there. Did you guys see that one? Yeah. Um, yeah. For the they have yeah the soundtrack in that. That's. They did a marvelous job with the soundtrack on that. Sounds just like the uh, the Game Boy and Nintendo versions. Do you know the story about that? No, I don't. Well, you tell you can tell when you come up, All right, which we'll be here any minute. I'm pretty much done. Um, so yeah, if any of you are interested in the Atari 600, just check out that Tinkernut video one more time. I'll just mention it in case you want to check it out and go from there and have fun. And I hope this I hope that some of you guys decide to do that because I want to play some games that you guys make. I want to see what you guys come up with. It'd be really cool. All right. I'll take over to Ed over here. Okay. All right. I'm going to try to get this hooked up. The, uh, 
the Tetris, you, you should go to the Atari H booth and look at it. It has a funny name called Chitri or Chitri, something like that. Um, the, the story about that is that the, um, this girl showed up on the Atari H programming uh, bulletin board uh, or our forum, which is very rare, and she was cute, and she put a lot of little hearts in her uh, posts, and, and she said, I want to make an Atari game, uh, which is hard, actually, and, um, and so all the guys were like, okay, we'll help you, you know, and then, and so then she, first day, she posts this thing, and it was like, I'm, I want to do Tetris, and she puts, has just like a square falling, it's like, oh, everyone's encouraging her, and then the next day she posts a bunch of code, I can't figure out what's wrong with this code, and all these guys are like, oh, you need to change this, and you need to change that, I've never seen people be so helpful on the Atari website, and um, yeah, exactly, and, and uh, you know, and then the third day she posts something more, and the fourth day, and by the fifth day she has this incredible working Tetris, you know, and, um, and, but it still has a few flaws, but it is amazing. I mean, the Atari, if you see that Tetris, it's multicolored blocks. The Atari doesn't support multiple colors on a single line like that. It, it's actually an amazing piece of programming work. And, and so all of a sudden the guys are like, who is this girl? You know, and, and then on the, seventh, on the seventh day she released that, basically. And the seventh day happened to coincide with April Fool's Day. And it was actually a group of programmers who had been working on the side for a year. And that this was their funny way of rolling it out. Unfortunately, there were no women involved with this project. But... Um, but, uh, but they really fished in some of the people on the forum. I'm, I'm happy to say I did not respond. Um, anyway, <coughs> I should have. Uh, so yeah, this is, uh, this is about me. Basically, I wrote games for the Atari back in the old days, and then I went to a place called Microsoft, and I worked on Excel and Word, and then I made games. I worked on the Xbox and did a bunch of stuff, and now I work on a lot of other game-related things, and I also do a 3D printing company. But for fun, I wanted to make a game on the Atari 2600. And the reason I wanted to do it was I read this amazing book called Racing the Beam. And if you have any interest at all in making old games, or uh, especially Atari games, I'd start by reading this book. It's really, really fun and talks about how interesting and difficult the machine is to program without being too technical. Um, so that is a great place to start. That made me want to start to write a game for it. and so. I ended up making this uh, game called Halo 2600, which for some reason my video didn't play there. Um, but that's okay, because I have way too much to fit in the 10 minutes I have anyway. Um, things you should know about the Atari 2600, uh, it's really hard to program <laughs> this machine. It's really bad. It's really bad. Um, uh, starting, I, I didn't do Batari Basic because I had worked on the 800 in the old days, um, but in, unless you have that experience, doing, going the Batari route is a really great way to go. Um, but if you really want to, if you're really crazy and you want to be, do it the old fashioned way, program it in uh, hand 6502 assembly. Um, the machine uh, really was made to support this game and, and not much more. It's a game called Combat, and uh, it has, shows the capabilities of the machine pretty clearly. It has two sprites, which are the two tanks. Uh, the two tanks can shoot uh, bullets at each other, which are one-bit sprites. And then it has a, a low-resolution play field, which is the graphics you see in the background, it's, which is 40 pixels across. and. Uh, that's all you get. Uh, oh, you get one other thing. You get, there's one other one pixel sprite called a ball. And so, um, and you can have four colors. You can have the background color, the, the play field color, and the two colors of the sprites. And that's all you get. Um, but it's actually a lot worse than that. Uh, the machine doesn't have a, a frame buffer like we were talking about before. So uh, as the programmer, you constantly have to know where the electron beam is as it's drawing the screen, which is why that book is called Racing the Beam. Your code is constantly trying to stay ahead of the electron beam and change things just in time as they appear on the screen. So normally when you're making a game, you don't have to count how many clock cycles every single instruction takes, but on the Atari you do. Um, and that makes it exciting. Um, but there is a really great uh, emulator debugger. Um, I, there's several out there, actually. But I use one called Stella. And uh, it's really nice. It, it um, shows you uh, the registers that control the, the two sprites and the, the pixels uh, for the play field. Um, this part up here, uh, can you see my mouse? Yeah, OK, good. This part right here is uh, your 128 bytes of memory. So it's really nice when you can see all your memory all at once. 
Um, and then you, then you have your code and then a picture of the screen and stuff like that. Um, and uh, you get 4K to put your whole entire program in. Uh, that, that little picture there is 32 pixels across by 32 pixels down by 32 bits per pixel. That's 4,000 bytes, 4K. So all your code, all your data has to fit in that little square. <laughs> That's one way to think about it. If you don't do bank switching, which, right. you know, I think is cheating. But <laughs> 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 no, I'm just teasing. Um, so anyway, but when you, once you disassemble it, it looks more like that. That's a disassembly of Atari 2600. Um, and uh, this guy actually makes these. You can print, you can have, hang that on your wall if you think that's beautiful. But you can, you can see on there the, uh, the yellow is data and then the other stuff is code and the branches end up as little lines connecting one thing to another. Um, but I don't have time to talk about any of that. So what, what I'm gonna do, I just wanna show how, um, how Halo 2600 evolved over time. Um, I read that book, Racing the Beam, and it made me wanna make a game. And so um, I tried to make um, a version of Halo. And so I started with the Master Chief. And by the way, the only way I can have his helmet be yellow like that is that's the ball. So, <laughs> so I have the two sprites and then the missiles or the bullets that go between them and then I needed to stick the ball in his head to make the helmet. Um, which is why the walls are yellow because I wanted the helmet to be yellow and the ball does not have its own color. So that's a great example of, exactly. On the Atari, you just have to live with what you have. So in, in November, it looked like this. My, one of my main play testers is down here, my son Jasper. He's now eight. Um, uh, by December, I had uh, three enemies, um, and uh, people who know about Atari know, see how the, the left side is all black and the right side isn't, and how ugly that sort of looks? That's actually the, what the Activision guys would do. They would make the entire left side black, and they did it because they didn't like there to be these little black lines, which I'll show you in a minute. But basically, you can, in certain circumstances, you can reuse a sprite more than once. But when you reuse it, it leaves a black line on the edge. So if you reuse it every single line, then you can at least make the entire left edge black. But you'll see that in almost every old Atari game. You'll see that these weird black lines on the left edge. They didn't really show up as much on an old style TV, so they didn't worry about it. But um, anyway, I'll talk more about that in a minute. By January, I had my little title screen. I normally go by the name Ed Freeze, but in, in, when I did my Atari games when I was in high school, I was Eddie, so I went back to Eddie for this. It was like you, I hadn't, I hadn't worked in 6502 for 30 years, so it was fun to go back to. Um, and but you know, now, oh, I have to pay attention now. See, so now I had some little enemies and they were like, I could run around and shoot and they're shooting at me. Um, and, and if you killed them all, which I probably won't do, then you could um, advance forward to the next screen um, and then you could do it again, over and over again. Yeah. So I wasn't sure, I, I thought that would get kind of boring, just going like forward through a tube and fighting these guys. Um, and so at that point I thought, well, maybe every five levels or so I'll have a warthog level, because I want to have the warthog from Halo. And I thought, well, maybe it could be kind of like Moon Patrol. And so I had this little, this little uh, warthog, and he went over this bouncing terrain, and then those are halo banshees up above, and then they're supposed to like swirl around and drop bombs on you. Um, I had to cut this because this was uh, like a K, a K and a half just for this little thing, and um, I, the base game, I only had 4K, so I wanted to have a title screen, I wanted to have 64 rooms that you'd fight your way through, and then I wanted to have a boss at the end. And I didn't have room for the warthog, level and frankly it wasn't that much fun anyway so I wasn't sure how to make it fun so uh, the warthog level got the axe so you got to see that um, so by April it was starting to look kind of like the game that you see today um, I had this title screen I had this really weird star effect and um, that um, people hated um, actually Ian Bogos the guy who wrote uh, Racing the Beam I was in touch with him by by this point and he kept, he kept saying, what's with the stars? How come the stars look so ugly? And I, sometimes when you're too close to something, I don't know, I, I thought they looked fine, but he kept bugging me about the stars, so finally I had to change the stars. But I have the little ring, and I have Halo 2600, sort of. So I had a title screen. And, um, and the game's starting to look like the final game. You can see those black lines that I talked about. But, but the important thing, sort of at, at this stage of the game, is now you can move up and down. And, and really, so you can move through an air, a map and, and 
battle your way through and find keys to unlock areas. And if you hit the trees, you die like I just did. Um, there was only one life back then, and it was kind of hardcore. If you hit anything, you died. My play testers didn't like that. Um, yeah, that was bad. Yeah, that was bad. Um, but, but yeah, so by June, they had talked me into giving them three lives, and there, there were things you could pick up, and, 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 you know, it was starting to look a lot like the final version. That shouldn't have died there. That was a bug in the program. Um, but anyway, it's starting to look kind of like the final program, but it doesn't have the boss encounter. Um, so let me talk about that, and then I'll talk about this. So I really wanted to have a boss fight, um, and... The boss fight was really difficult because, I'll show you that what I wanted. I wanted, like any game, when you have a boss fight, you, you go into the final room and you're all of a sudden in a really big room and the boss is bigger than anything you've fought up till now and you have to kill the boss, you know, you have to shoot him, but one shot isn't enough, right? It always takes three shots for some reason to kill the boss, so it takes three. I'll, I'll, I'll try to kill the boss here, but I won't. But anyway, so to make the room look big, I had to make the Master Chief look small, which turned out to be really difficult, and I can talk more about that later, um, but um, yeah, he killed me, so I lose. But anyway, so um, I got the boss encounter, um, but there was one thing I still didn't really like. I didn't like the, the fact that the, there were those black lines, and um, there are some techniques that Atari programmers understand now for getting rid of those black lines. Basically, there's a, a register that you strobe right, um, right as the electron beam is coming back across. And if you, if you store something in that register, it leaves the black line and then it moves things. Well, people have figured out that if you hit it just a couple cycles before it's going to come back, um, then you can get rid of the black line. But it causes all these other problems where things don't move the way they're supposed to. Um, and so this is like a test app that I wrote with these. Those are actually supposed to be ducks, which shows you something about my ability <laughs> to program or to draw. I mean, but, but I know. It, it wasn't meant to be a graphic de demonstration, but it was meant to show that you can move things smoothly without having the black lines. And so once I had done this little sample app, then I, I took that and applied it to to Halo, and oh, and so I had fixed the stars by the final version, and I had got rid of the black lines, and um, and this is basically the game as it exists today. The, um, and so that is, in, in a real nutshell, the evolution of Halo 2600. Um, <laughs> I, I have a bunch of slides about the code. Um, this is the one I was talking to you guys about earlier, just so this is just for the people sitting up here, but um, anyway, it's a really fun machine here. You only have 76 cycles per, uh, per scan line as it, it's drawing one line of the screen, and so the challenge when you're programming this machine is to fit everything into 76 cycles. So this is the code for the boss encounter, uh, and me trying to jam everything into 76 cycles. So basically, code to handle the Master Chief, code to draw the boss, code to draw the missiles. I'm up to 71 cycles. And then I just have enough space to decrement my loop counter and branch back to the top. It adds up magically to 76 cycles. And that's why the Atari 2600 is fun to program. And that's it for me. Thank you. So um, we tried to, we said we were each going to talk for 10, and we probably each talked for 15. So <laughs> we're okay. We have time to answer some questions from anybody. So um, yes, Jasper. You forgot the He's right. I did not talk about something called Magic Land. So about two-thirds of the way through making Halo 2600, um, actually my playtesters had been complaining that when you run into everything, it kills you which I did because it was easy. I, because <laughs> um, when, you, when you hit something, you're already in it. You're like, once you collide with something, you're, you're already past where you want to be. And so I was like, well, how do I do that? I was like, eh, it could be really hard. Like, if you hit a wall, you have to bounce off at a different direction. But how do you know which way you hit the wall? Um, so, so, so what I did was I looked at some old co code, which there's a lot of Atari code out there, and I said, I, I, how do they do that in Adventure? So I looked at Adventure, and they did something very obvious. They just 
remember the old place they were, and when if they hit something, they just move back to the old place. Okay, that sounds great. Simple solution. I put that in. But what I didn't think about was, what if you run into something right as you exit a room? So you hit the wall right as you exit the room. And so it, 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 what, it, what would happen, it would put you back, but instead of having you inside one of the 64 rooms that I designed, it could throw you off to somewhere else in memory, basically. And, and, and the program started to interpret memory as if it were, it just tried to do its best. It said, okay, these bytes say what kind of monsters and what they look like, and these bytes say where the walls are. And so all of a sudden, I was in a different place that I hadn't built. So I called it Magic Land because I didn't, I didn't build it, but you could actually run through it. And you can do that. I, I left the bug in because I'm lazy. Um, no, because it's a nice feature. And uh, it's in every Halo 2600. And if you just run into the wall right, at, right as you leave a room, you can get teleported into Magic Land. And you will see the weirdest stuff there in Magic Land. You'll see weird monsters that are, yeah. And so um, anyway, thank you, Jasper, for reminding me of that. Maybe we should take, we'll see if there's any from the rest of the audience, and then we'll come back to you. That's the easiest way, yeah. In the first room, you can do it. And there's videos online of people who figured out how to cut through Magic Land and get to the boss, oh. <laughs> uh, which, which is kind of annoying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, no, it's kind of a tricky shortcut. All right, what other questions do we have? One of them. Uh, so uh, I had the months on there, but it was basically I started in November and I finished. My goal was to release it at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo in July, and so um, I, I made that goal. But it was it was definitely very tight. Um, I like I said to some other people, I trying to fit into four thousand bytes was really hard. I ran out of space. Uh, a couple months before I was done. And so every time I wanted to add something new, I had to take something out or rewrite a piece of code so that it would do exactly the same thing but do it in, with less bytes. And, um, and that got really, really hard. Um, I thought I had taken every little extra byte out of the program. And after I shipped, there was a bug with it on a, a StarPath supercharger. I knew there was because I had used every byte, and you have to reserve a few. And there's a guy on the Atari Age bulletin boards named Nuki Shea. And uh, he, he, uh, so some of you may know Nuki. And Nuki went in and immediately found several bytes that I had missed. So tells you something. But yeah. Uh, part time, yeah. Yeah, it's, it was part time. How about, how about Super Mario? How long did that take? Late June, um, yeah, late June, and I just like a day before this event, uh, I got the, all the final major bugs out. So that span of time, what's that about? June, July, August, two, two and a half months or so? Yeah. And that's just off and on. It's definitely not full time because so we all have day good. jobs. And I mean, Batari is a pretty good, oh, good right. way to go. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah, from 1-1 one, one to 4-4. Four, four. You yep. got 16 levels, right? Yep, 16 levels, yeah. And I also made uh, an external editor. So I, I went to my old uh, Quick Basic and uh, made a level editor. And uh, what it basically, actually, I run the old DOS uh, text editor, make my levels that way, and then I run it through a program I made in Quick Basic to convert that level data into data that the program can use. And then um, just copy and paste it right into the code. Yeah, that's actually something that surprised me. I put out the Halo source code. Anyone can go and, and hack on it. And it would be easy to make another version that had a different map. Mm -hmm. um, I'm surprised that nobody's done that. But yeah, go ahead. You had a question? Yeah, a question. Um, it, it's about the reproduction cartridges. Um, exactly what's the process to obtain one of those and burn the code onto it? So um, you t how did the Halo cartridges get made? Is that the question? Yeah. OK, so there's a guy uh, who runs the Atari H website and is here. His name's Al Russo, And he makes cartridges for the game community. So um, I had been in touch with Al while I was working on the game. And he wanted to put it out in cartridges. And so we agreed to do it at Classic Gaming Expo. And then he made that run of 150 of the original cartridges that, that were out. Uh, people who collect them know that the, um, 
after Classic Gaming Expo, he then did a second run that's a different has a different label on it, and um, they they actually neither of those have been available for sale for um, like a year, year and a half because Al got busy with a bunch of other stuff. He just did the third run. He's just starting to do the third run, and so you can go to his booth and you can buy one, which is good because the old ones they were rare and they they were selling on eBay for up to five hundred dollars. So. Um, I, I'd suggest going and getting one from Al for you know twenty or fifty. For your, for your own stuff, they do sell their circuit boards, which you can then program blank EEPROM uh, chips, basically, if you want to manufacture your own. And if you don't want to test stuff, there's the Harmony cartridge, which is yeah. They also have a really that. great cart called the Harmony cartridge. And what, what it's, I wish I had one when I was making it. <laughs> I used a different method, but we, but. Um, but a Harmony cart, it, it's uh, an Atari cartridge with an SD slot in the top. And so you can just go put your game on the SD slot, plug it right in, and then stick the cart in, and uh, you're good to go. So it's very, very handy. Um, and of course, it works for any, any binary you download. So you can download old games and play them. What else? More questions? Yes, sir. I'm curious if uh, your experience programming with such limited memory affected any of your other programming uh, professionally. Uh, if you started you know, trying to you know, save a few bytes here and there by changing things, just out of habit or curiosity. I've always, I've always been a pretty tight programmer, and I think it's just because of when I um, grew up. Uh, I started programming actually programmable calculators. Um, and because we didn't have computers, so you know, uh, so and they don't only have like a hundred steps. So you try to fit your program into a hundred steps, and then I went and did Atari stuff. So even when I write C um, and C plus plus, I tend to write pretty tight code. I think, um, but it's not the same as I mean. You really have to worry about things on the twenty six hundred. So I, I, I still wouldn't compare it to that. Um, I'm still. I was constantly reshuffling my code around to try to fit things in, and I couldn't fit everything in that I wanted to in that game. So yeah, that's definitely. In in my case, I'm probably permanently brain damaged from working on this old stuff. Um, but the one place where it does still really apply, I mean, almost one to one, and is what what I do as a engineering consultant is embedded systems. Um, so a lot of times, you know, if you're making a million of something, they want to buy a processor that's. 53 cents instead of 54 cents. You know, it makes a difference. And I've had a couple projects just in the last couple years that came down to either literally zero bytes of flash left or mm -hmm. one byte left over. And just that mindset of, yep, you've got 1K of this and 200 bytes left of there are still controllers to this day that have those sort of similar specs. And the thing is, they end up being used in flashlights and, you know, toasters and, and that kind of stuff. But, um, Believe it or not, there, you know, there is still a call for assembly language programmers and people that can pack something down into something that is very small and very cheap. And the upside of that is also very low power. So arguably, cell phones and PDAs and laptops and you know, everything else that's out there, tablets, low power is pushing smaller code and less memory as much as nostalgia is now. So there, there is upside. You can do it for a hobby, and there's actually still money to be made as a commercial endeavor for it. Yeah, and even, you know, I mean, I, I do some stuff in the game business, and, um, you know, you're always wrestling with the frame rate. You always want the fastest frame rate you can, and you always want to display as many things as possible on the screen. So you're still always up against limitations, even in, in modern games. Mm -hmm. Um, now, that always infuriated me when you were used to Atari 800 and 2600 games that were so fluid and so smooth, and then you started looking at early PC games or any of the Apple II where it's draw, 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 draw. <laughs> it just, yeah, frame rate was, was king back then, and then it sort of went away, and now the push is coming back. You know, everybody wants 30 FPS is sort of scoffed at, yeah. and 60 is better, right? <laughs> so. Well, it's funny. I mean, all the bad things you can say about Atari 2600, but it runs at 60 frames a se yep. second. Yeah. All I mean, full time it always does. FPS. It yeah. always runs at 60 frames a second. Yeah. And the, the other neat thing is probably unrelated, but 
the fact that after all this time, they are still discovering new hardware techniques on the 2600 and tricks. There was the interlace, de interlace video stuff a while back, you know, double your vertical resolution. You know, who'd have thought? I mean, this is ancient hardware by every standard, and people are still finding new things to do with it. It's crazy. Yeah, people are, are still doing new things on the 2600. Um, and uh, yeah, some of them, like I said, that Tetris thing, just the colors, the multicolored blocks is really technical. Um, but even games back in the day were doing, the machine was not not at all designed to do the things it did even back in the day. Like the Galaxian, I think it was just a work of art back then. I mean, but the, just, I mean, because the Galaxian, they actually show um, like eight or nine sprites across the screen. And it only has one. Uh, but and, and you can show the one tripled, so you can make it look like three, but how do they get eight? It has to do with this total weird hack that they do. But I don't know. I mean, it's an incredible machine. It's incredible what people have been able to get out of that machine over the years. Cool. Any other questions? <laughs> All right. Where is the booth, Jasper? When you come in. Right when you come in? Well, right when you come in, it's your, it's your left, your right when you come in, I thought it was on the right, but yeah, you, it's the Atari H booth. You can't miss it when you come in. Yeah. Thanks to you guys. Um, I, I, I yeah, think we're all going to go watch a Tetris final. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you.